Welcome once again to AM Israel. Everybody remembers where they were on 9-11 as we approached the anniversary. You know, there's a story that's told that there was a survey done on a college campus where they asked students, what was the most prevalent attitude on campus toward major issues of the day, ignorance or apathy? One student raised his hand and said, I don't know and I don't care. You know, caring and knowing about things which are vitally important to each and every one of us is something that is at the forefront of our minds each and every day when we think about people who sacrificed their lives on 9-11, a day which happened in infamy just seven years ago. We're approaching that anniversary now. When it happened September 11th in 2001. On that day, many, many stories of bravery, of heroism have been recounted. One of them which has been recounted, but not in the way that you're about to hear it now, is the story of a man named Abe of Rami Zalmanowitz. With me today on AM Israel are Yaakov and Chavi Zalmanowitz. Yaakov, Jack, is the brother of Abe. Abe perished in Tower 1 in 9-11 how he perished, and what it stood for in ways that we wouldn't even begin to imagine is what we're about to talk about today with Abe's brother, Jack, or Yaakov, and his sister-in-law, Javi. What are your thoughts now as we're approaching seven years later on the day in which your brother not only had his life taken, but in fact really gave up his life for someone else? 
it's seven years, as you said, it's seven years, and uh, it's a mixture of different feelings. On one hand, the aches have not gone away. We think of him every single day, and we miss him dearly. We were very, very, very close. We were very close in the family, my wife, myself, and he. Uh, lived, he lived with us for many years, and the aches are still there. The acts that he showed at a uh, despicable day of infamy uplifted the hearts and the minds and the attitudes, I would say, of millions of people. Throughout the seven years, the phone calls, the letters, the organizations, the, the uh, recognition of this orthodox Jew befriending a non-Jewish quadriplegic man who was helpless in a wheelchair, who somehow made a life for himself on his own right. The story is, is a, a famous story, and we will try to uh, enlighten you on some of the things that not everyone knows about. And uh, if you want, I will start now from that day. Let's go back to that day. 9-11. 9-11. You got a phone call. You or Javi got a phone call. No, no before, I, want to go, I want to go back before that. 9-11. S seven o'clock in the morning, I was davening by Rabbi Halberstam, where we were saying slichas. My brother usually davened. That's for those who don't know the slichas or the, the prayers. The prayers said like three days to b before Rosh Hashanah, before the New Year's. Right. And uh, my brother Abe usually prayed in a different synagogue, but on this day he decided to come to our synagogue and we prayed together. That was unusual. That, that itself was unusual. After we finished the prayers, uh, he was sitting in the back as he always did. He was like to be uh, as not noticed as possible. He was very, very uh, quiet in his own way. And I was sitting up ahead uh, where my regular seat was every day. After we finished the prayers, uh, I went to the back to say goodbye to him. He was going to work from there. He had his knapsack and uh, other things. And as we said goodbye to one another, we embraced we embraced, we hugged each other. Excuse me, if I, I always get. Uh, we hugged each other and we wished each other a good day. And he went his way to his work and, and I went my way. Did and you normally, an act he normally hug each other? When you, you, never happened, never happened, never happened. Especially not in, in the synagogue. Something just spontaneously Something happened? spontaneous. Can, can I go back a few days? Okay, I'll prior go back to a that. few days prior to that. What happened? On that, on that Sabbath, on that Sabbath, on that Shabbos, in the afternoon, my brother went to a, a uh, lecture, a shayer, uh, which was given by the, the rabbi's son, who in his own right was, uh, is a big Talmud Chacham. And the subject, and the, the safer was uh, the... Uh, Balatur, Balatanya. Balatanya, I mean, excuse me. He gave a shear in the Balatanya. And believe it or not, the chapter that Shabbos was on Kiddush Hashem. And Kiddush Hashem meaning sanctification, sanctification of, God's of a person in, in relation okay. to, to God. Uh -huh. And my brother was, was sitting in that shear, and uh, the rabbi was speaking about the subject, and my brother int interrupted in the middle of the shayla. 
which was something he never did because he was always very quiet. He would listen to the shear and he wouldn't usually interfere. So this, this was time, unusual that he just this interrupted. This is just that he interrupted and he asked the question. He understands Kiddush Hashem, sanctification of someone to give up his life for God. A Rabbi Yakiva, uh, the the great the great teachers of that time in the Roman during the Roman Empire, uh, he could understand how they would come forth and and do the proper thing. But can a, a normal human being, a plain ordinary person, how does that person prepare themselves for such a, a fact? And he got an answer. And the, and the rabbi started to continue on his drusha, his speech. And my brother interrupted a second time, saying he wasn't happy with the answer. And he asked the second time and a third time. And uh, witnesses told me this subsequently when I was sitting shiva, because I wasn't at that shiva. And he got his answer on 9-11 in his act of the way passion, the way he compassionate way, the way he acted. Let's talk about that. Kami, who, who picked up the phone first? What what happened? Who, well, what time did the phone call come in and what was the, the describe the phone call? The sequence of, it, of events was that Jack would take me to work every morning. He drove me to work. And I would get there at 8.30, quarter to 9, and he dropped me off and started on his way home. And he had the radio on and he heard that a plane had gone into the one of the Twin Towers. Didn't know at the time what really were the circumstances, and so he came home, rushed home, turned on the TV station. And I think he only had one TV station at that point. That's all the reception we got. And he heard what happened, and he tried to call a friend of He tried to call him at work. On and his cell phone or on a office phone? No, office phone. He tried to get through. Seven years ago, we didn't know much about cell phones. So he called the office phone. There was, there was uh, no answer. And I called him, he called me, and he said, no, we haven't heard. I also tried to call. I was at work when I heard what happened. I tried to call a vinyl, didn't get through. A little while later, the phone rings, and, and Jack told me that he heard from a vinyl. Vinyl called and said that he's okay, he's with Ed, and he's getting ready to leave. That was the message that I you know, had heard in my own mind, and I was happy to hear that. We were so relieved I even called. Getting ready to leave from? And that's, what, that's what we thought. Getting mean, from the office. He, he knew that the, the building was under attack. He didn't know it was under attack. He knew something had happened, but he didn't know. None of us knew it that early on. We didn't know that uh, it was a terrorist attack. We how did no he idea. know he had to leave the building? What did he? He knew that. Well, how he knew was that he. Uh, I'll just get to tell you that after he got the call, after Jack got the call, a few minutes later, I got a call from Abe too. I received a phone call, and he told me that he was okay, he was fine, and that. Uh, he was there with uh, with Ed. Ed was the fellow who was Ed the paraplegic, is, is the, right? Ed is the quadriplegic. He was together with Ed, and that Ed had a, an aide named Irma, Irma Fuller, who was with him all the time because he, he just had no use of his hands or, or legs, his arms and legs. But she wasn't there then? Well, she had been up. Her The usual uh, procedure was that she would go up and get breakfast on the 43rd floor mm. cafeteria, and that's where she was. She was upstairs then. Getting breakfast. And she was higher. They were on the 27th floor. So there at the side of the building that she was on, because this is the building that was hit, the first building was the North Tower, she... There was water coming down, there was a lot of smoke, and she was coughing, and she was mm. an older woman. So she made her way back down, because she left Ed alone at that point. Because Naturally, because she didn't want to leave him there. Alone. She came back down, and you know, so, you know, explained what was going on up there. Again, they did not know the circumstances, because we didn't either. And uh, at that point, uh, because she was coughing, uh, Abe told her that uh, she should leave, and tell the people downstairs that they're on... They're at staircase uh, a a 27C, let them know this is where we are. And she did report that to uh, some rescue workers later on because we spoke to her about it. But this was this, the circumstances when he called, this is what he told me, that I'm here with, with Ed and I told, you know, I told Irma that she should go and I'll wait for help with, with uh, Ed. And he reassured me that the air was clear where he was, they didn't sense that they were in immediate danger and I really, I don't think, I don't know if it was 
thirty at the point, nine fifteen. I, yeah. I don't know exactly yeah. what time it was. I can't recall. But you know, trying to urge him, he said Ed wants to wait uh, for help. I said, but please let him know you have to get out. You have experience with a wheelchair. Your father was in a wheelchair. He used to take him downstairs with with uh, steps with a wheelchair down a flight of steps with help, of course. So just reassure him that you're capable. Me not realizing this is a man in a heavy wheelchair, a 280-pound man, so it was going to take a lot of help. And what was going on at that point was a constant rush of people going down the stairs. But this is the last thing that we heard from him was that he was okay, he was breathing fine, but that there was a fireman, uh, while I was on the phone with him, I heard in the background a fireman came to speak to him. And he, he told me that he had, that the fireman wants us to move to another area now. And that was the last we heard. This was, this was the last conversation we had, the last contact. And you know, the rest we know. The rest you know. So actually what happened was, you're saying that he had befriended this fellow Ed B. A. Yeah. Bia. And they developed this relationship. They friend of, yes. They were very, uh, very close. In fact, they uh, would go out to eat uh, dinner many times, of course. It was a glad kosher restaurant. And Which your brother had to eat, but, is, but the but young my brother always made sure that the restaurant had wide doors because the wheelchair had to be wheelchair accessible. So he had, to, you know, he, so it makes sure, because he thought of Ed B.A. all the time to make sure that he can get in without any problem. And, and he would, they would eat dinner together and joke around a little bit. And this was the social life of Ed B.A. That was basically, he, he, the mom he, relation, he, he had a friendship with he him. He had a friendship with him. He, he was that type of person, warm and caring. Didn't matter who the person is. But are we to understand, though, that your brother could have gotten out had he not remained behind. Of course, of course, all the people, there, there were 1,700, 1,900 employees, employees of, of, of Blue Cross, his company. And uh, how many uh, perished? I think nine. Nine perished, and he, was, uh, and he was on the lowest floor of all the people who were working for Blue Cross Blue Shield. And so he, he just could have, he could have gone down, but he couldn't leave him. He couldn't leave him by himself. Uh -huh. he, uh, he couldn't leave him. You know, we found and he out, stayed. Uh, we found that afterwards uh, from a brother of a fireman that there was actually a fireman with him at the time that they knew about. These brothers, you know, they have a they have, the firemen have a brotherhood, and the, the, this fireman, uh, Billy Burke, Captain Billy Burke, uh, the brothers wanted to know what happened, where their brother was at the time, because it turns out that all the men in his engine, Engine 21 and his company, they all made it out. Now, we found out that uh, Captain Burke was with them on the 27th floor, and he looked out and he saw the first, first tower collapse. He saw the South Tower collapse. And that, at that point, he ordered all his men to uh, evacuate, and, and they made it out. And he said to his men, you go, and he said, you want us to come up? And he said, no, because we found out from the survivors it was written up. And he said, no, you go and get going, I'll meet you at the rig. And all the men got out, his men, he was able to communicate with them, they all got out. And he said, I'm right behind you, I'm here with a man in a wheelchair and his friend. And, uh, and no, he got killed he with them, the three of them got killed the together. Three. And they were very similar types, they were, they were all single men. Two in the 40s, uh, Abe in his 50s, all favorite uncles. Everybody, everybody loved these these guys. You know, their their nieces and nephews. As a matter of fact, our Abe was uncle of Ramo. That's how he was known to our children, our grandchildren, our children's friends. All called him Uncle of Ramo because they were always in our home, and he was he was this this kind of guy. Yeah. He told them these things. He made up stories for them. Our nieces and nephews, my nieces and nephews, who were not related to him, called him Uncle of Randall. To this day, they speak about Uncle of Randall, even though he wasn't related to them. But uh, this is this is uh, this is the type of person he was. And it turned out we heard the fireman was the same type. Ed had a nephew, and Ed became a surrogate father to this nephew when when his his uh, when Ed's brother had passed away, uh, brother-in-law. And it was, uh, it was something to sort of like, it gave us some kind of feeling, a good feeling to know that 
these three men who were each a hero in his own right. I mean, the fireman goes without saying, just by the nature of the occupation, it's a heroic one. Every time they go out, they don't know if it's going to be their last time. Ed, what he did with his life, he was 21 years old when he suffered a diving accident at his own birthday party, and he was sentenced to a life in a wheelchair. It took him a good, I think, six years till he turned his life around because it was a terrible adjustment to make, and then he went to school, became a program, and he, and Abe always said that he was a very brilliant person, a wonderful chess player, and he was a hero too. And Abe, it, it, it just goes without saying. And you know, his actions that day didn't really define who he was. He lived his entire life that way, of, of being a caring person, a giving person. He would do anything for anyone. And he was a person who anticipated people's needs. Uh, even Ed, for Ed, he, he, uh, Ed was a cigar smoker. And Abe built a cigar stand that he was able to just place the cigar down, you know, when there comes a point where you have to, you know, take it out of your mouth. He built him a cigar stand. He liked to read Ed, and Abe built a book stand for him because he had sent away for one that wasn't, didn't work properly. He built him a book stand. He built numerous things in our, in our home. He, he was a, a master carpenter. So this is... Uh, this is this caring, giving person. If he saw that you needed something done, he didn't wait to be asked. And this and is just, how he, he lived his entire life. Do you feel that in part, yeah. let's, from a, not just a humanitarian perspective, yeah. which is obvious here, yeah. but specifically from the perspective of his training in yeshiva, as yeah. Jewish values which were inherent in that, yeah. was there something yeah. native to that that you saw manifest in, in, in his behavior prior to that and during that? Do you think that, that was reflective of something that he had in terms of his, his own Jewish upbringing? I think uh, his nature was, was a, uh, a... He probably he developed it himself. He, he was very caring about everybody to say that somebody is caring is a, and, and that's they, a better it's a real loose term. They get, yeah. he's, a lot of people are, are caring. Yeah, but but, but you he, know, but when but, somebody but cares for the poor, where, where they're willing to stay by yes. somebody's side to give yeah, it their life, this that's more, this, it's a lot more so, than caring. So that's that's well, you that's. You can give an example of how he he dealt with your your father. You know. Uh, Good is, idea. Uh, is, my father, in his uh, later years, latter years, he he was he was uh, he he could walk around, but. He, he, you know, he was, he was old already, he was uh, close to 90 then, and, and my brother was living with us then, and my father was living on East 9th Street near Torah Vadas, and he would walk every Shabbos, rain, snow, 100 degree out, and he would walk. Not when it was snowing. When it was no. snowing, not at 100 degrees. Uh, no. not, uh, yes, on 100. Oh, every Shabbos, unless he, whether he, it was whether the, rain, no matter what the weather rain, was, rain, sleet, or snow, or hot weather, rain. he was there. And and he walked to to eat uh, the the uh, he walked to take him to shul in the morning. He stayed, he walked from from here, and he walked to to East Ninth Street and eight and uh, and Cotelli Road, and he would take my father to shul across the street in Torah Vadas, and he would take him back home and he would eat the Sudas Shabbos, the, 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 the Sabbath meal with him, uh -huh. and then he would walk back home here to make sure that he had some chant, my wife's chant, to make sure that, that, he, that uh, she could see that he enjoyed the chant also. You know, so this like was that. something that was yeah, yeah. part and fiber. One time, okay. I, I got just one more. Th my father was sick in the hospital one time, and it was raining like, like we had a few days ago. It was coming down mm -hmm. unbelievable. And he said, he put on his coat, he changed his pants. He said, I'm going to visit daddy in the hospital. So how could I not go? With he? So I did the same thing, and we walked. We got soaked, soaked. And, and uh, Baruch Hashem, we came back, we were okay. So it sounds like, from this story, that his actions, in a way, kind of obligated you. He, he and, was he others. was way above me, in 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 many ways, and perhaps yeah. many of us yeah. in that yeah. instance. Oh, and perhaps that's one was, of the things we need to was, take. He was this, take take an example from, and and he's someone, uh, Rabbi Halberstam, 
where we davened, he he said he said he was he, he, he was a, a supreme uh, human being. You know, that it's interesting that you, what you said about you know taking something from this ourselves, from what learning from what he did. Uh, in October 2006, we had a um, there was a bill had been, a bill was passed a few months earlier allowing us to uh, change the name of our street or put an additional street. A sign on it that now it was to be called Abe Salmanowitz Way, our street corner. And at the dedication of the street sign, we had politicians, we had rabbis, and one of the rabbis who spoke, a good friend of ours, Rabbi Zucca. He said, Rabbi Shlomo Zucca. Shlomo Zucca. He said that uh, it was really very fitting that the sign should read, because sometimes you would put up uh, the name of a person and, and a street, street lane, lane, avenue, whatever. road. We we wrote uh, 9-11 hero, Abe, Zolma, Abe of Reynolds Almanowitz Way, Abe of Reynolds Almanowitz Way. And he said it's very fitting that the sign should read Way because Abe of Reynolds showed us the way that one should conduct his own life, his life, in both in regard to his treatment, his relationship with God and his relationship with his fellow man. And that's exactly how we feel about it, that, that this is something, it's, it's there for us to learn from. And people all over have, have said how reading his, of his, his action, reading his story has inspired them so you know, to, to believe in, in the goodness of mankind at a time of, of, of such horror, such a despicable act of, of, of hatred and horror, to see how, that there is such goodness you know, in mankind that this is something that he's there, his way is there for us to, to learn from. Now, Abe wasn't married, I understand, left no. no children, but I understand that there is a child in the Zalmanowitz family that does carry his name. Actually, there are two. Can you tell yeah. us about that? Yeah, well, it, what, it, the, the timing was really amazing because uh, we were first notified in August, in August 2002, nearly a year after the tragedy, that uh, the medical examiner's office had identified remains and we were able to make a, a burial and Abe always wanted to be buried in Israel and so we were able to quickly put together work uh, arrangements to, to have a funeral. We had a service here and then we had a, a funeral in Israel and uh, interestingly he wanted to purchase a plot himself a few years before, wasn't able to, but he did want at the end of his life to be buried in Israel and we were able to to uh, get a plot for him where his parents were buried, and Harzaisen. interestingly on Harazesa, Mount of Olives, and the plots were the plot that we got where for his burial was adjacent to his parents' burial places. It was amazing. We didn't know about it until we not arrived. intentional and not planned before. It, no, we didn't. But we didn't. The but the who one who the took care was a was a real tzaddik, and that there was there was a plot available there, yeah. and he arranged. He arranged it, it without it telling amazing. us. It At was any surprising. Rate, we to us. had um, our, our daughter-in-law, one of our, uh, our one of our daughters-in-law was expecting a baby then, and the baby was born uh, two days before the funeral. And a week later, uh, at the uh, at the bris, the, the circumcision, he was named for Ren. And a few months later, our daughter gave birth, and she also named her son for Ren. But it's funny that it was too difficult for them to, Aramel is a, a nickname for Avram, and that was what Abe was known by all the time, Avramel, Uncle Avramel. They couldn't bring themselves to use that nickname for the kids, and so they had a different nickname for Avram, Avi, and they're both called Avi. But they're named for him, their Hebrew names are. There was, only, there was only one Avramel. There was only one Avramel, right. And hopefully that one of Raymond will be a name that uh, we'll all remember and uh, it will make a difference to each and every one of us. And his name will be perpetuated along with all those who perished. But in particular, the, the act of, of courage and self-sacrifice is something we'll all be able to take something with us and integrate it into our own lives. It's a song that a uh, family member of yours had written and I'd like to go out with this and 
the last line says, What makes America great? What makes America shine so bright are the lights of justice, truth, and peace burning through the night. He said, For them, those who perished, there's no loving. We can't love those who hate. There's no peace for those who love war. People standing for justice together. That's what makes this great eagle soar. And indeed, Ramal Zalmanowitz and those who perished with him, Kiddush Hashem, were merely for being people who were willing to live for what is just and right. Their memories will indeed soar. There's a cold wind blowing tonight across the land Thousands of innocent lives struck down by evil hands And it makes America weep And it makes America cry Most of all it makes every good man wonder why There are many who give their lives for the greater good There are some so filled with hate they'd burn it all down if they could but what breaks america's heart are the ones who can't tell them apart justice is where the american dream must always start standing alone against the night standing up for what we know is right oh it makes america when good people 